Divine Fitness Ministries, uh, we take the opportunity to uh, honor our uh, young men and women that uh, graduated from high school um, and or college. And what um, I do, um, and I've done it um, since 2017, is um, I'll, uh, I'll get a picture with them at some point in time throughout the year, and it's on my phone, and I'll print that picture out, and I'll write them a personal letter from me to them and put it in the frame, and I'll read it to them, and we did that um, this past Wednesday night, and we have, I think we had, because I, mis I, I, I miscounted a few, I made a mistake uh, or two, but we had about 16. Um, and two of them are here, so if I could get uh, Lauren and Matthew to stand up and uh, let's give them a hand. They're two of our graduates from Moody High School. Um, proud of you guys and all uh, the seniors. I wish the rest of them were here, you know, but that's okay. Um, you know, this, uh, like Ryan was just talking about, uh, the crowd, y'all can sit down. Um, a crouching wild animal at the door, ready to take you out. That's what this world is going to try to do to you. But make sure you stand strong on the word of God and you stay at his will. And if you do those things, you'll be fine. So um, that's it. That's something, like I said, it's something that we do uh, every single year. I know we did it here at the church last year. We did it at the ministry um, during Bible study. Uh, this time, uh, during uh, Baptism. We had four that got baptized also on Wednesday night, and we've already got three set up for the month of June. So, uh, we, yeah, there you go. We'll keep that going, too. So <clears throat> that's all I have. I don't want to take up too much of Jeff's time, but thank you to our seniors, and thank you to you guys for your time. Um, one of the Wednesday nights when we do it here, when we have the baptism, uh, you're missing out. I mean, it, you, ought to, you ought to make arrangements to show up to one of those. Every Wednesday night, the Bible study is done at Divine Fitness. And then at the last Wednesday of each month, it's here. And we do it outside, and, and Willie baptizes however many he has on the lid. But I'm telling you, it is a sight. It is, I mean, you, it, this place is packed outside with young people and uh, parents and family to those that are being baptized. So, and there's always food, so, eh. yeah. yeah, exactly, right? Uh, six o'clock is what time it starts, but really, it, really it gets going about 6.30. Yeah. Um, the official time is six, but I'm telling you, you can fill your bellies and uh, enjoy seeing these young people uh, getting baptized and just uh, ah, it's it's really neat to see. And then he does a presentation, gives them a Bible and a pla uh, um, certificate, and it's just it's really awesome to see. So try to make arrangements to do that. I think you would enjoy it and see what we're doing, what this ministry is about. So that being said, we're talking about transformation. If it, you saw my title in the bulletin, it's trans that is needed. Um, some of the questions that I want you to ask and think about is what does it mean to be the church? Not a church, but the church. What's it supposed to look like? Um, if we could start, are we close to what it's supposed to look like? That's one thing that I've, over the years, I've found looking at what the church is supposed to look at look like according to the Word of God, the body of Christ, and then I have to step back and say, are we close to that appearance? Another question is, if we could start over, would we change anything? Are we more concerned? This is the questions that I have for the local church. Are we more concerned with programs or processes, demographics or discernment, Models or ministry, attractional or inc uh, incarnate, uniformity or diversity, professionalism or passion, seating or sending, and decisions or disciples. And these are questions I'll explain 
what I mean by all these comparisons and really um, things that are in contradiction of each other. I fear that as a church as a whole, I fear that the church, the body of Christ, has become lax. I really do. Uh, some of you talking to several of you about this, I believe, have the same sentiment that we've, as Christians across this country especially, but ultimately in the world, we've lost our edge. We've lost our passion. We've lost our zeal. It was wonderful when Cade had to leave at break, but I had Cade speak um, a couple Sundays ago downstairs, and Cade spoke on zeal. And it was wonderful. And it was because God had put it on his heart. And I feel that in the church today, we've lost our passion, our edge, our zeal, kind of uh, our mojo, as some say. In some ways, we've become, and I've used this word many times, and I've heard other Christians use this word, we've become complacent. We really have. We mirror the church at large and have become a group of spiritual consumers across this country especially, myself included, from time to time. Uh, does the parking lot, other questions, does the parking lot flow? Are the seats comfortable enough, right? Is the temperature right? Is the music on beat and on key is the message just right according to what you want it to be. Um, and then you think, what do our guests think about this? These are all questions that unfortunately we spend too much time thinking about. Again, it's become, we've become spiritual consumers in the church across the country today. While none of these things are, are wrong, questions and concerns, in fact, how we address them is indicative of how we view the importance of excellence in the church. If they become our gauge or our ruler, then our emphasis is in the wrong place. If that is how we gauge how the local church is, based on parking lot flow, seats being comfortable, temperature being just right, music being exactly what you want the music to be, and so on and so on. If we put that as our gauge, our ruler, our, our standard, then our emphasis is in the wrong place. A lot of what I've been reading and listening to recently has led me to this idea of transformational Christianity. Transformational Christianity. Uh, defined would be a faith in Christ that not only changes me, but works through me to lead others to be changed in Christ also. So not only that's transfer, uh, transformational Christianity. It's not only is it changing me, the Word of God, but works through my life, actions through my life, words through my life, are leading others to be changed as well through Christ. This means that God didn't save me to put me on His trophy shelf, <laughs> right? But to become an instrument of transformation. See, we, a lot of Christians today, walk around thinking that after salvation, God just places them on this shelf and says, oh, look at my other child. Look at this child. And we walk around as if we're just on a trophy shelf. But he's, the reality is he's, He saved you and put you in a place to lead others to transformation. Romans 12, 2, the key passage for this, I've quoted it so many times throughout ministry, it says, do not conform any longer to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. A couple things to point out is we conform ourselves. We're the ones that are conforming ourselves. So it says, stop conforming ourselves. 
The first step is we have to live a life where we no longer conform to what this world wants us to be. We no longer want to be lax or complacent or blend in. Instead, we want to, to allow Him to transform us. God wants to transform us, to change us. That verse tells us that. It says, do not be conformed. Stop conforming yourself to the ways of this world. And when you do that, you're able to allow a transformation that takes place from the power of the Holy Spirit inside of us. He wants to change us. He won't force it on us, though. He won't force it on us. Be different, right? Don't be like everyone else. Be a nonconformist. We are to be peculiar people beyond usual, right? Don't live like we used to. Don't live like those that without hope live. Don't live like those without peace live. We are to be radically different than what the world looks like. We are to be radically different than what the view of the world is. We're to have... Look, look, look at these things, these comparisons again. There's greed in the world versus self-control, moderation. There's anxiety. Well, that's a big word. I meet people all the time that have children that are seven, eight, nine years old and they're on anxiety medication. Well, my child is full of anxiety and stress and depressed. And I go, well, really? How old is your child? And I'm expecting them to go, well, you know, 18, 19. They go, well, eight. Eight? And they're depressed and they're anxious and they have anxiety? Well, yeah. I mean, when I was eight, the worst anxiety I have is like how long I'm going to get to stay outside and play before mom calls me home to eat. You know, that was my anxiety. Maybe a little older, anxiety of will she check yes on the note I give her, right? But you understand, is anxiety is filling this world, Christians as well. Versus peace, desperation versus hope, takers versus givers, uh, consumerism versus redemption, contempt versus love. See, God's love does not manifest itself in clever slogans or bumper stickers. Though we like to put them on our cars, God's love is made known to the hurting, to the downtrodden, to the weak and brokenhearted in and through transformed lives. Trans transformation is made known when we're willing to get our hands dirty as believers, as churchgoers. Transformation is made known when we're willing to get messy in the process of helping others experience transformation. Transformation takes place when we begin to think differently. When we begin to pray expectantly. When we're authentic with ourselves, with God, and with others around us. When we are committed to a community of other transformed believers. When we discover and employ our spiritual gift and when we become radical disciples of Christ. That's when transformation takes place. There's some, there's some in churches across America who are praying for and anxiously awaiting this revival that we are experiencing in this area. But revival will not come from hell, fire, and brimstone sermons. It will not come from Sunday to Wednesday services. It won't come from reading another book about the subject of revival. Right? That's the one that always gets me. What are you reading? I'm reading on how to have a revival. Good luck. 
You know, three steps to revival. It won't come from reading. No revival will come when the Western church stops coddling, trying to coddle people to faith and instead begins developing radically transformed disciples who are willing to live and tell their stories of transformation of God's glory, then we have a true movement of God. Again, when we stop trying to coddle this faith and this gospel of faith and grace gospel to people and say, no, we're going to show it to you through the experience of how God transformed me when I decided to stop conforming myself. That's when the movement of God is seen and grows stronger and stronger. It's time to quit playing church, in other words. It's time to quit playing church. If you don't want transformation, then don't come. <laughs> Mr. Adam is probably sitting there going, why did he say that? No. <laughs> what is he doing? No, but he understands. If you don't want... He said it the first half. He, when he was before the Eucharist, he was saying that... We want people here that want to know the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. If you don't want that grace gospel, if you have no interest in a grace, grace gospel, then don't show up. Don't come. We don't want people that have no desire for grace. And you think, well, that's mean. Oh. Sorry. <laughs> we want people that have a desire to know God's grace. And not only do we have a, want people that have a desire to know God's grace, but beyond that, we want, a, a, we want people that have a desire to be transformed. Again, it's time to quit playing church. The church is not a thing. It's not an organization. The church is a living organism. It's you. It's me. We are the church. And we're to be catalysts for change and transformation in this world. The greatest problem with church today is not our beliefs. It's not our stances. It's unchanged people. Followers who aren't willing to be radically transformed. Disciples who aren't willing to say, whatever you want, Lord. Christians who are Christian in name only. It's their box to check under a religious section on a survey or a medical form. When the world sees followers who aren't following or believing, who don't believe, believers who don't believe, it's not going to move. You, you understand that. If, if it's the world is looking, and trust me, the world is watching, if it sees followers who aren't following and believers who aren't believing, then guess what? There is no movement. There is no transformation. There is no revival if that's happening. If we choose not to be transformed, to not be missional, to be takers and not givers, we might as well close down today and turn this building into another used car lot <laughs> because 411 needs another one, right? <laughs> Did you understand that? If we're a group of people that choose not to be totally transformed by the renewing of our mind through the power of the Holy Spirit that lives inside of us, if we choose to, to not be transformed, if we choose to be takers but never givers, again, we might as well close this up. Radical transformation empowers our theology. Right? They will know us by our love. 
Sound familiar? They will know us by our love means nothing, nothing without a transformed mind. They will know us by our love means nothing without transformation. We are, when we are transformed and live out that transformation to a hurting, to a weak, to a broken-hearted world, let me tell you, it will make a difference. When we use our transformation to help others be transformed, then there's power in that. The gospel message without a transformation is hollow. Comfort and complacency kills a move of God. Not because He's not powerful, powerful enough to overcome it. Of course He is. But because He doesn't bless. Listen to this. He does not bless mediocrity. What? He blesses transformation. He blesses those willing to give their lives wholeheartedly. So what would it look like instead of hiding or ignoring our transformation, we live it out practically? Luke 4, 18, 19 says, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because He has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Again, Luke 4, 18 and 19. Jesus said that His mission was to help people change, is what He's saying, right? His mission was to help people change from imprisoned to free, from blind to seeing, from oppression to release. This is good news, and it results in the Lord's blessings. This is transformational Christianity. It doesn't leave people where they are and it leave them wishing that they could be different. It's real. It's, it's hard. It's messy. It's what the Lord blesses. What if we really believe that we're better united in, in this transformation? What if we join together to teach life skills, to address youth problems, to, to provide job training? What if we so, saw so many lives transformed that drug dealers and, and, and uh, sexual predators and people like this had to leave town for the lack of business? What if... We gave ourselves away truly to the kingdom of God with the same kind of dedication that the first century followers had or those that are in China that are underground. What if we gave our life over with that same strength and charisma? What if we unleashed our spiritual gift and our abilities, our talents that God has given to us and started uh, missional outreaches all over the county and the region, the state, and spread from there? What if we lived it so real that people all over this area were talking about the legitimacy and reality of a personal relationship with Christ? What if we thought outside the box and started personal, uh, if we thought outside the box and started um, ministries, not only with young people, but older people and everything in between? Whether you believe it or not, God wants to use your story of how He changed you in order to reach the others that need to be changed. Maybe it's time to stop being a casual follower and become radically transformed follower. Maybe it's on time again, uh, maybe it's time to let God again unleash the spiritual gift that you've been given and use it and use it. That's what we need. I hear it and I wanted to bring this to you because I hear the word, I use it. A lot of times we use it on Wednesday nights. This revival word. Don't let the revival stop. 
True transformation is a change from within that only God, the Holy Spirit, can give you and have you going out and shining and impacting those around you every single day. You have to, again, Romans 12, 2, it says you have to stop conforming. People ask me all the time, they say, well, how do I do this? How do I change my life? How do I become this? How do I become that? I say, well, first of all, you don't change your life. God changes your life. And they say, well, how do I get to that point? And I say, well, you have to stop conforming to the world. You have to stop, stop looking like the world, in other words. What do you mean? Well, you're still going out and partying and drinking, but you're going to church and you think that that's okay. You got to stop the sexual lust. You got to stop the, the lying, the anger issues. You got to stop looking like the world. Stop buying into the lies that's all over the media and all over social media. Whew. <clears throat> And when you do that, then the transformation will begin. But you have to choose, right? How do I choose? You study the Word of God. You pray. You take it serious. You want to change, then you stop conforming to the world. How do I do it? You learn what God's children are supposed to live like. You pick up His Word and you study. Well, how do I know what to study? Open it up. Pray. God will speak to you. The power of the Holy Spirit will tell you what you need to study. If you've got a problem with anxiety, then guess what? Look up verses about anxiety. If you've got a problem with anger, guess what? Look up problem with anger. If you've got a problem with addiction, look up problems on that. If you've got problems, and the list goes on. And you'd be amazed how these people go, I never thought of that. You know, you'd never thought of that. No, I just go to church and, and, and I open my Bible to whatever brother so-and-so says at the sermon. I listen to the music. I close my Bible and I don't open it again until next Sunday. Well, then you have no desire to be transformed to be more like Christ, do you? <coughs> I never knew it. So you want to be a part of the revival or you want to be a sideline sitter watching it go on around you? We can make a bigger impact than what we're making now. We really can. We can make bigger waves than what we're making now. You know, I watched a movie the other night. A good movie. Oh, man, it was a good movie. Um, it's called The Impossible. It's about the big tsunami that hit uh, Thailand um, that killed like 260,000 people, I believe. This is about a true a family. It's a true story about a family that survived it. And they were separated and they had to find each other. It's got Ewan McGregor. It's really good. Tom Holland's one of the little boys. But I started thinking about that wave. And I started thinking that wave can represent one of two things. It can represent worldly things. And we're seeing that across this country, aren't we? We're seeing a wave of immorality, a wave of, of worldly teachings that is crashing over this country. Or... It can represent the power of the Word of God. And think about that. Is the power of the Word of God being a wave that will take over this country? And I just want to surf on it. I just want to ride it. But it takes a decision. It takes a commitment. It takes understanding what the Word of God is teaching us. It takes no longer sitting back, being complacent, being laxed. It takes a time to look at Romans 12 too and say, you know what? I'm going to stop conforming. 
God, transform me. Make me be a big part of this revival. Make me impact people that are around me, even if it's just at the gas station. I want people to see a radically changed child of God. I want people to feel it when I talk to them. I want them to go, wow, I see a love that you have that I've never experienced. What is that? It's Jesus. It's Jesus. <laughs> the importance of sitting here on Sunday mornings under Mr. Adam's teachings and paying attention to what he's teaching what God the Holy Spirit is teaching through him, what God has put on his heart. I cannot stress enough the importance of that. I have been blessed. I grew up, I started going to his church when I was two years old. I grew up under that teaching. I grew up being taught how to break down the Word of God for application purposes. I've been taught what's truth and what's lies, what's false teaching and what's true teaching. I've been taught the power of grace, which is the biggest conflict we have in this world today, isn't it? Is grace. Grace is what's being attacked all over. Don't take it for granted when you sit in here. Take the notes that he's printed and study them. It does no good if you just leave it here on the pew. It does no good if you fold it and put it in your Bible and don't get it out until you, it falls out <laughs> next week. Oh, what's that? Oh. Make it real. Make it real. I want us to all be a part of this transformation together, this revival together. I'll tell you though, Willie will tell you too, we need help. We need people. We need people that say, you know what? I want to be a part of that. I want my gift to be sh shining through that and be used through that. We need people. We'll pray. We'll um, do the offer. You did the offering first half. Yeah, we got to do the pledge. We'll do the pledge after we pray. Um, again, see Willie if you if there is any desire for you to be. If God has put it on your heart to help in the ministry that He has, please see Willie because this is a prayer that we've had, and and I know it's getting it. Hey, it's a lot on him. We need people to step up and say, hey, I'll help any way you can. Trust me, there is a place that you can help. Him and uh, Miss Joan, they stay whew, busy, busy. So pray about that. Father, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for the opportunity to stand up here and just deliver what you put on my heart. It's, uh, it's such an honor to be a part of this church again. It's such an honor to, to be a part of Mr. Adam and Willie and, and all of those. I mean, John and Rick brought here. I mean, all these people that, that I've watched and, and how they've done an excellent job of serving you and your son all over the world. So, Lord, it's such an honor just to be a part of this team, a small part of this team. I pray that you'll continue to bless this church. I can pray that you'll continue to bring people through those doors and not for just financial and consumer reasons, bring them through those doors so that they have ears to hear. That's what we want. We want ears to hear that are open to grace. So I pray that you'll continue to bless us that way. Pray for Willie's ministry and Rick's ministry and John's ministry and Gary Horton's ministry. I mean, all these ministries, Lord, have been such an impact in my life and still continue to impact my life. So I pray that, 
that you'll just bless those ministers tremendously and give them ears to hear and wherever they're at. Lord, I'm excited to be a part of this revival. I pray that this revival will not die down and that we'll have more people that step up and say, I'm no longer going to be conform myself to this world, but Lord, transform me. That's all you want, Lord, is us to stop so that you can start. Again, thank you for this church. Pray for the camp coming up that you'll just continue to bless Tony and Sherry and David and Megan and all the staff and all the people that are part of that, putting it together. Again, bring people to them. We need young people for no other reason than to get them one week out of 52 that they can hear and see the love of Christ. So Lord, we, we love you. We pray these things all, ask these things all in Jesus' name. Amen. Rick, would you lead us in the pledge, please, sir? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all.